My name is Volodymyr Lovrenchuk, and I have been invited by the organizers to moderate this panel discussion, which in our program is called World After Ukraine's Victory. Prior to starting the event, I would like to have the organizers make sure that we have our online stream. No, the stream is not on yet, but I would like you to let me know whenever that happens. So, I'm going to give the floor to the speakers right away because it is extremely important to see the speakers prior to hearing them. So, the people we will not be able to see right now, I hope we'll see them as soon as the streaming is available. So, we'll have Parag Hanna, who is the founder and managing partner of Future Map. a famous author of the Future Vision, author of a range of books and publications. I'm pretty sure a lot of you have heard of him. And then uh, we'll have Isabelle Dumont participating in a panel discussion. She's a diplomatic advisor to uh, French President Emmanuel Macron. We will also have Natalia Krivda participating in the discussion. She's the director of NBA programs in Edinburgh Business School. We also have Valery Pekar. He's the president of Euro Index. And Johan Glebowitsky, the founder of Promova. Johan, welcome. I wanted to tell everybody to close the doors, but the doors are closed. So, so I'm going to pace a little bit because after the speech of the Prime Minister and prior to his speech, the times are very difficult. And so talking about victory, it's so inspiring that it's very difficult to sit in a chair and start moderating the event. So please accept me pacing and then later on I'll sit down. So uh, the agenda is the following. We'll start uh, f from rapid questions, rapid fire. We'll hear our speakers answer yes or no. I have three questions, and I'm going to uh, tell you my questions. It might take 10 to 15 minutes, and then our speakers will share their opinions of the world, their opinions of the future um, in the framework of what is most important right now. We'll have time for questions, and we'll have time for a summary. It'll take an hour, so I'm going to start off. I'll start with a short introduction. Because the word victory and the world after victory inspires, of course. It enchants, entices. Talking about victory means we need victory. We need to seize this crime. We need to seize this murders. We need to seize these atrocities for each of us and for all of us, for Ukraine, Ukrainians, and not just Ukraine and not just Ukrainians. But it is obvious that we need victory to make the world better after our victory. It's a very easy question. I asked it to a couple of my former chiefs, um, older European bankers prior to this conference. I asked them, will the world be a better place? All of these gray haired people didn't answer me right away. After a pause, they told me, yes, the world will be a better place. Because after World War II, after World War I, societies in many countries and the leaders of many countries, they agreed on a better, safer, more economically beneficial order of the world, which was better than before the war. It does not justify the war in any way. But history is a testament to this fact. That's what the old bankers told me when I asked them about it. But we all know that the world became a better place not for long. And the new threats arise, and the new world wars arise, or local wars arise. And so my first question for these rapid fire, will the world be a better place? And if so, what will be uh, the most significant geopolitical outcome? Security? democracy, smaller differentiation between the rich and poor. So what will be the axis of this development, of this improvement? 
Please, Natalie, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, dear guests. I am the professor of the Tarasuchenko University. All this time, my students have been taking their classes from shelters, and they will be the ones who build this world. The people who are 17, 18, or 25 today, I really have a lot of hope in this generation. Critical thinking, ability to select, ability to choose, ability to refuse something you are not willing to accept, which might not be the smartest choice, but they are sure in their choices. And I'm convinced that the world will be different, better or worse, but different. But I really would love to live my, my uh, through my old age in the future that will be built by these young people. Yes, the world will be a better place. There will no longer be a Russian empire in this world of the future. It is very significant, and that's why the world will be better and safer. And it will be safer not only here locally, but also in the Middle East, in Africa, in many places where Kremlin is stretching their hands. That's short-term perspective, five years, mid-term perspective, 20 years, the world will become either better or worse. It depends because we are standing at a crossroads. It will depend on where we turn and where the world turns on these crossroads. We'll talk about that later today. I will try to narrow it down to us. And if I want to say that if we win in this war, it will be better for us. And we will be moving on to these new qualitative indexes that have never been seen before. We had never been convinced in our ability to defend ourselves. We have never before been convinced that we are able to take care of our lands the way we want to. We had never been convinced that we are able to develop and protect our identity and culture. At the very end, this means that the next generations will be able to have the independence and the liberty to do whatever they want, not what they have to do. Thank you, Yevhen. I would like to take a second to draw your attention to the fact that uh, Barakhana joined us. If you can hear us well, we would like to welcome you here from Ukraine. Thank you for joining us. Can you hear us? Yes. So we'll uh, continue with the rapid fire here in this audience, and then we'll give the floor to you. I would like to let everybody know that we have translation into English, and I would like the speakers to use Ukrainian, and so there will be translation into English and back. So my second question, it will take a couple of minutes, so bear with me. Informational revolution that the prime minister has been talking about, we're really proud of how digitalization is entering each of our worlds and how we are improving the quality of life through the digitalization. On the other hand, we are bearing witness to the fact that the use of digital technology and big data from retailer strategies has moved into political competition. There are a lot of election interference in other countries. There are people using digital means and digitalization of human behavior to zombify whole nations. We're bearing witness to the fact that a neighboring state, for the most part, is supporting their invasive war, being convinced that the invasive war on another country's land is patriotic in a way. This has been a significant threat, and it's been discussed widely. Does the world have a way to protect itself against the fake information, which the audience is getting used to because it's very difficult to distinguish between what is true and what is not. Will there be a world after the war? Will it be different? Will it be protected from fake information, from fake propaganda on a mass information level, or whether this threat will become more significant? Yes or no, you have hands of floor is yours. I believe that we will eventually reach a point where we'll need to regulate everything, including social media. I believe that we'll reach a point where the things that seem uh, absolutely naive and simple today will be precisely studied and precisely analyzed from the regulating state bodies, for example, when licensing media. So in that way, the world will be more secure. As we can see, the more we move into less fair, the more we move into the libertarian dream of lack of regulation, it turns into chaos. And so 
The issue is not in the presence or lack of regulation, it's in the human nature. No, the world in this regard will never turn to facts. There will be more post-truth, post-facts, post-history, and all the other postmodern elements of it. But each and every one of us will be able to build a safety net around ourselves, where there will be facts, where there will be truth, and there will be real history. And that will be the task of every single human being. I believe that this non-linear development of postmodern practices, uh, poly semantics of the world, the informational element of the world will only grow stronger. This is a personal front. This is a personal fight of each and every one of us. And I think that the state structures responsible for it will have to play a crucial role. Uh, education, the system of national education, which has to take care of what people read, how do they read, do they need to interpret it. These are the skills that we have to teach young people. And also a significant player on this stage are the mass media. There's a lot of responsibilities that they bear. Everybody remembers the story about the radio of 100 Hills. The responsibility is bared by the propaganda as much as on the enemy forces. So only after the conclusions are drawn in regards to the people who are spreading this fake information, only after we can understand what the situation looks like, only then the situation can change. Thank you so much. As far as I understood, the opinions are slightly different, but I think that we'll come back to this question. Actually, I think now we're all uh, on the same page, so maybe I'm on a different page for sure. Um, I wanted to come back to this question because I believe that in Ukraine, um, this idea of freedom, of independence, of free speech, it's very valuable on the genetic level. It's coursing through our veins, so limiting media, limiting the information stream, something that you said, Yevhan, I think. Well, no, I think that what's happening in Ukraine is actually ridiculous, starting from the marathon. Because the issue is not in limiting free speech during the war. The issue is in how much these things are happening discretionally. The issue in, is in how it's done. In the moment where the uh, social communication is suppressed and we are spending billions on channels like Rada, in a time where we see that a lot of decisions in regards to informational uh, area are it, it are made through the political viewpoint where it would be more useful to kick off the stream the people who has been poisoning ukrainians minds it shows that we have not made any conclusions institutionally we're just permitting the situation to reach a boiling point and then we'll react and for the most part, just like the judicial reform only changes after people start putting uh, corrupt judges into bins, into actual garbage bins, I think in this way we actually mistake independence and freedom for chaos. We mistake dictatorship for responsible imitation. You have to calibrate our optics in order to understand what it actually is. Very often things that we call freedom and protect as freedom is also a form of dependence. Very often something that is a form of regulation and limitation is actually institutionalized protection of freedom. So I think we are, in, in this regard, we are very young as a country and we don't know what we're talking about. Thank you for explaining your stance. That you actually uh, helped me to come to my third question. And then I'll give the floor to Mr. Hanna for his comments. And for his messages for us, I would like to talk about interdependency and codependency. Amongst a lot of other opinions that I've encountered while preparing for this, I've heard an opinion that Ukrainians have to be aware of the fact that the most significant instrument of security is a mutual economic interest. And this is something that actually shaped the understanding of security in Europe. This is something that has to be commented on. So. We have mutual economic interest that in 2022 has led us 
to seeing ourselves being dependent on Russian oil, on Russian gas, not only the energy system, but also a lot of other state systems. How did this mutual economic interest um, led to us perceiving the aggressor in a different way? So in this case, the mutual economic interest was not an instrument of protection and defense, was an instrument of codependence. There are more and more information on the news in regards to armament, in regards to ammunition as a better security instrument. Will you comment on that? Do you think mutual security interest will grow in Europe as we have it today? Or will it be replaced by armament as a tool of influence? Thank you. Valeri, we'll start with you. Countries that are living on the inside of these large communities who are surrounded by their allies can, re can keep their armies small. The countries that live on the frontiers, and Ukraine stays on the frontier and will stay on the frontier for the next 200 years, countries like this have to have really strong armies. Mutual economic dependence will only strengthen within the communities, and it will be questioned only when there will be ethical and ontological conflicts. There will be a lot of questions to China. Do we have to depend this much on China in terms of cheap labor? Just as much as there are so many questions to Russia right now, do we really need to depend on Russia's energy sources this much? If we're talking specifically about Ukraine, I'm not going to give any recommendations to Luxembourg, for example. If we're talking about Ukraine, Ukraine will always have to have a very strong army because we'll always remain on the frontier. And to the northeast of us, there will always be chaos. Thank you. Natalia? I'm not looking at the movie, I promise. I have numbers and quotes here. This is my, my academic bubble influencing me. I personally believe that we'll have to change the optics. I'm actually really convinced of that. From uh, force methods of influence, from... Uh, uh, please understand me correctly. From victory strategies to win-win strategies. This Roman club idea that was voiced in February 21st, uh, that we have to move our focus from uh, finance capital to human capital and natural capital, and we are projecting on the future. This idea has to become very strong. And the second thing I would like to draw your attention to the values. The front line not only falls where forces come in contact, it also falls where values come in contact. And on one side of this line of contact of values, there is the great liberating war, as Russians call it, the Second World War. And on the other hand, is the actual World War II, as all civilized nations call it. I continue talking about it because the projections of the past define the visions of the future. And if we do not start the value revolution, the change of this value paradigm from families, from education, in schools, in universities, if, if we don't create the cultural competency, there will be the key competence of the 21st century after our victory. Not in the sense of culture as a decoration of our lives, but cultural competence is the ability to make decisions as the highest level of liberty, freedom, and uh, reliability. If we do not create this revolution, if we do not enact these values and culture, it doesn't matter how much we strengthen our army, we'll still lose on the inside of the country. And I would like to just develop on this idea because Hitler also had values and Putin has values. We're not talking about just the values in general, we're talking about what kind of values these are. And I think that we have a structural issue here. Our economy is globalized, our technologies are globalized, our influences are globalized, but the decisions that can impact all of these processes in a positive or negative way. This regulation is local solely. If you had any global challenge and you could only respond to it from your city or from your small community, 
this is the same situation. And so we'll eventually have to reach a better system of regulation. UN is obviously not as effective as we thought it was. Russia is blocking every decision on the Security Council. There are five countries that are able to make decisions for all other countries constantly, no matter what they do. And so we are having this issue with the quality of regulation, with the quality of framework that is established. And until the point when we restructure ourselves, we'll constantly face issues like these. I actually think that we'll eventually see the global dictatorship tax when the um, market where dictators participate will just be taxed instead of prohibited with another forms uh, which will eventually lead to what happened with Germany or uh, for what Ukraine is paying for. Thank you. Now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Han. Thank you very much for joining us. And I would just like to make sure that you can hear us and you can hear the interpretation. Can you give us a nod, please? Or stick up your thumb. I would just like you to provide your comments on this thesis concerning the mutual economic interest and interdependence, because you have a lot of works about these areas and about these thoughts. So would you kindly also provide some of your cons considerations concerning the uh, rapid fire, Paul, that you have just heard, and provide also some of your visions concerning the international development and your comments on Ukraine, because all of us are found in Ukraine at the moment. And we can see the developments of the events heavily weighing upon all of us. So what will happen to all of us once victory comes? So would you kindly provide your comments based on our specific pathway? Thank you so much for having me join you today. I want to extend my gratitude and sympathy and support uh, to Ukraine, people of Ukraine. It's uplifting to hear this conversation that is taking place right now. You are having a very rational, constructive, pragmatic uh, conversation, despite these incredibly tragic uh, circumstances. It's amazing testament to the willpower and solidarity of the Ukrainian people. Uh, I have warm memories of my travels in Ukraine that really date back to uh, just after the Orange Revolution. I visited Ukraine several times. I actually wrote uh, the first long chapter of my very first book about my time in Ukraine. And I'll just uh, share a joke. Even though Ukraine is the only country in which I've ever been robbed, I still have such warm, wonderful memories of uh, my travels across the country. Now, on a more serious note, um, in that book, I warned about frozen conflicts. We hear this term frozen conflicts quite a lot. And it's very often used as a way of pretending that these conflicts are off the radar and that one doesn't have to worry about them. I know that you disagree with that, and so do I. I have always despised this term frozen conflicts because I believe that any conflict that is not settled can always blow up. And that's part of, of course, what has been happening in many of the former borders or borders of the former Soviet Union. Uh, in my studies of political geography, I've come to the conclusion that an unsettled border is an unstable border and a powder keg that is waiting to blow up. And I hope that uh, one of the things that is a, comes in the aftermath or the conclusion uh, of this tragic war is that there is a very, very clear border, border settlement and that other regions of the world learn this lesson. And Ukraine, of course, is rightly insisting on its terms. And wherever this border lies in the future, and of course, to some extent, that is going to depend on the military and the power dynamics as they play out in the coming months and beyond. But wherever this border lies, I do see Ukraine as a member of NATO and a member of the EU in, of course, whichever order, EU first, perhaps NATO second. But I think we have to end the ambiguity. There should be clarity, clarity in institutions and clarity in borders. Now, I mentioned the EU. The European Commonwealth to me is one pillar 
of the world order alongside North America and Asia. So as you can tell, I'm speaking first and foremost about regions, not about states. And one of the things that, one of the trends that has consolidated, that began before COVID, but has certainly accelerated since, is that there is this regionalization in the world economy. North American system, European system, and an Asian system. I call this scenario continental drift. Now, very often in geopolitical conversations, we've talked about Russia as a European power, as a Eurasian power, but certainly a country that whose primary dealings were with Europe. That's certainly the case now in the, with respect to the present conflict. But Russia's future, perhaps in terms of its economy and its geopolitical isolation from the West, pushes it ever more towards Asia. One of the things that I have said for a long time, simply from a geographical perspective, but now it's certainly true diplomatically, is that Russia is North Asia. Russia is not going to be treated as a European country, despite its geography. It is effectively North Asia. And as you can see from the diplomacy of the past year, Asian powers, in light of their energy interests, have been much more accommodating of Russia than Western countries have been. So you have a North American system, a European system, and an Asian system. Now, one important thing about Asia is that Asia is multipolar. China is not the only pole of power in Asia. You have India, you have Japan, you have Australia, and so forth. And so you actually have, in terms of global order, a multipolar world and a multipolar Asia in a multipolar world. That is the structure of power today. There is still a lot of interdependence, a lot of trade, a lot of financial flows. We hear about supply chains being disrupted, but supply chains have been very resilient, actually, throughout this crisis. So let's, and throughout COVID as well. So commodities, finance, trade, technology, people, ideas, continue to flow regionally and globally across regions. And this is despite the pressures for near shoring of production, industrial policy to bring supply chains back home to their own borders. Despite all of that, globalization continues to flourish. In fact, America's trade with China has grown this year, and America's deficit in trade with China continues to grow as well. So we should not worry about the future of globalization. You should always focus on your role in globalization. What role does Kiev, what role does Ukraine have in the global division of labor and global value chains? And that is what I hear you talking about uh, today. And I think that's extremely important. Think about your strengths, your strengths in raw materials, in industry, in food, in information technology, in logistics, um, as a young society. All of these things are foundations, not only of national potential, they are assets that you want to share with the world, that you want to plug in to global value chains. The truth is that the importance of a country in the world is not its size, not its geographic size. It's the degree of connectivity. Ukraine has shown that not only is it a worthy power in terms of its size, in terms of its solidarity, um, in terms of its willpower, but it also has assets that should contribute to um, uh, the future of globalization and to global society as a whole. I believe that some of the biggest opportunities that Europe has in contributing to Europe and the rest of the world are its youth and its dynamism. And I think that in the phase that lies ahead, we should call upon Europe more to recognize and to incorporate and to elevate uh, these assets and these virtues of Ukraine, 
So I will end where I began, which is that to me, uh, we need to think about the future of settlement, not just in terms of borders, but institutions, and push very hard for the end of any kind of confusion or ambiguity, and that Ukraine should and must be accepted as a fully fledged member of the European Commonwealth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Hanna. You can hear a round of applause running around the hall. Thank you for your very kind words concerning Ukraine. And I would like, if we have any speakers have any questions to ask you, I have a personal question to ask you concerning the connectivity as you referred to it. Um, concerning the future impact and influences as well as interdependencies between regions, institutions, etc. So whether we Ukrainians uh, have any projects to made together with, in terms of connectivity with any other countries, with any other regions, because we have been on the crossroads of these conflicts. Is there any solution to this frozen conflict uh, that we can vocalize pragmatically, but not in general theory, as we usually s do that? Valerie, I'm looking at you. OK, I don't think that we have to build relations which in a year will be non-existent. I think that we have to build relations with the countries that will come up on the terrain of that territory with the predominant majority of those countries. I think that we will enjoy very favorable political and economic relations with them. Natalia, please. Mr. Hanna, I would like to carry on this conversation with you because it's really inspirational, firstly. And secondly, it gives a very specific determination concerning the areas of our conversation, lines of our conversation. Our time is running out. I've just tried to give the floor to our speakers. They declined. So now I'm going to give the floor to the speakers again if they want to raise their hands. Valerie has just raised his hand. So I would like to give to you five minutes for you to make uh, your interventions, and then we will carry on into the discussions. If you would like to interrupt each other, please go ahead and do so, because at the end we will have to formalize this practical assessment of the pathways for the better future the way we see it. Well, it will be difficult for me to do it in five minutes, because I was envisioning six. All right, then three minutes for you. Well, the key word for me is modernization. It's like uh, Alexander Herzak many years ago, he wrote a book, 26 percent, because 25 percent of the world live in the modernized countries. This is OECD countries, and I'm dreaming about entering that, then e the EU and NATO. Perhaps we will be that 26 percent if we modernize quickly enough. The five preconditions for that. So first, this is the security. Secondly, it's the critical mass of the population that crave for the changes. I'm not sure of that. I'm just having uh, some pool of hope, but not confidence. Next is the rule of uh, law. You know that we have thousands and thousands of vacancies, judicial vacancies in our country. And now there is also a competition going on concerning who will be determining uh, the judicial face of Ukraine within the next 25 years. So the whole generation is being decided right now, and the civil society somehow is mindless of that. And fourth is uh, the maximum economic freedom, and we stand somewhere 130th on the list of the economic freedom. And uh, fourthly, this will be international direct investment. So unless the previous conditions come true, we will not be able to carry on with the fourth one. So these things cannot happen after each other. We, th we have to do it all together. This is a strategic triangle, Euro integration, modernization, and uh, some other ones that I have already mentioned. So it all depends on how we will be getting out of this triangle of difficulties, this conundrum. So we can only hope that our country will be able to build and recover under such circumstances. Of course, we will have to have a lot of labor, um, working hands, fully abled people. Russia, three scenarios concerning its development. Either uh, the consolidation of the power, which means the continuation of the war or war after a short period of time, like the Second Chechen War, or over another generation, like the Second World War after the First World War. So this is the first scenario. Bad for everyone, America, Ukraine, and Europe. Next uh, scenario, this is uh, 
everything falls into the hands of Russia, of China. This is bad for Ukraine, for America, and for Europe. Next one is decolonization and reconstruction of post-imperial space, which is highly unlikely nowadays, but that's something that all of the countries have to put their heads together and work together in order to prevent it from happening. Nuclear arms, non-proliferation, etc. And the whole world is not two polarity that China is dreaming about, or three polarity as Russia is dreaming about, because she, she's definitely not a pole. But what Joseph Porel said, non-polar world. Because if we see the list of the G19, no G20 anymore, all countries except the countries of the North Atlantic um, Treaty Organization, and uh, some of them are also declining from this two polar world. Turkey, India, Brazil, South America, Saudi Arabia are not willing to live in a two polar world. That's why the world is not going to be a two polar one, but this will be a multipolar world. So this will be happening within five years. Within 20 years, as I said, Again, the world will be standing at another crossroads, and I cannot sp speak in detail about that because one minute was taken away from me. So we have to do something about adapting the, and accommodating the whole world to the IT because Greta Thunberg, climate change, Russian aggression, all of this is part of one huge crisis that requires reconsideration. We have to rethink our consumption, production, um, fossil fuel, and if we can do that, then everything will be good within 20 years. If we can, then everything will be bad. So the National Council and the development of the United States have already drawn five scenarios depending on how things go. Five they talked about, the others they did not even want to mention in, in great detail. So this great fork heavily makes the world dependent on one thing, whether the world will be able to make a qualitative mental breakthrough concerning the next generation. That's something that Ms. Natalia has already touched upon. And thank you. Thank you, Valeri. Oh, well, it's been fascinating. Please take one minute of my time and just carry on. Otherwise, Natalie, there will be no democracy. I really want to make sure that you speak because yesterday we interacted and I know that you have a very interesting message to make. Well, Valerie, I would like to use the statement that Mr. Han has just made concerning the frozen conflicts and the solutions. And is it possible to solve this conflict by way of our membership in NATO uh, if the Russian Empire stays within the format that it is in right now? Well, if, as we can see from yesterday, from yesterday, the day before yesterday's event, NATO is the structure that will stand up for its members only if the um, threat is real. But we have a lot of hybrid threats right now, and NATO will never be able to stand up for its members if all of these threats continue and per keep being hybrid ones. Everyone d tries to defend themselves the way that they can do it best. They say sometimes that states are not necessary. This is a huge mistake. Nationalism will be growing, but the world will become safer because the countries will learn to arrange and make agreements. But of course, uh, empires will have to go into the past. Once again, let me reiterate, we will enjoy wonderful relations with all of the countries that will be there on the terrain of the former so Russian Empire. Johan? So um, I would say that there is it doesn't really matter which club we join if we are dead, if we no longer exist. So for us, the solution is absolutely clear. It's right here on the surface. NATO comes first and then everything else. European Union, OCD, everything else. It's an issue of development. And NATO is an existential issue. I disagree with an idea that NATO fails to protect its members. No, it actually protects its members quite well. The question here is, that we are perceiving this situation, the situation with NATO, as, as it's someone who we would like to receive more help from. And NATO is just selecting from an entire arsenal of solutions, from political to economic to deterrence solutions, and then responds to threats. I visited multiple NATO summits. I remember the report of Mr. Luger uh, in 2006, a NATO summit in Riga, where he said that um, an energy-related attack is also an attack. They're well aware of hybrid threats. They're well aware of these challenges, even despite the fact that some of NATO members 
didn't do well as NATO members. They, they failed the 2% barrier of uh, the 2% of GDP for uh, defense expenditures. But the club is very strong. It's there. So we have to become a part of it. It's not even a question. So any conversations in regards to that we have to start with something else and then NATO? Those are conversations that are leading us into our grave. It's like discussing a surgery options uh, sitting at somebody's grave in the graveyard. This is an existential issue. Even despite the fact that we are here at a five-star hotel, we are leaving this place, coming back to houses which might not be heated, which might not have electricity. It is an existential issue. The second question here is what are we moving toward? And here I would like to bring us down to earth a little bit, to Ukraine. I looked at the state budget for this year. This is a budget that actually uh, prepares us for folding down the democracy. We see that the institutions of deterrence, the institutions of checks and balances are not being supported financially. What does that mean? That businesses of people present here will not value more if one if, if autocracy is established in Ukraine, and if we weren't able to see the long-term perspective with the Russian threat, as a consultant, I'm happy because I have more business now, because I'm assisting companies whose risk assessment teams did not see Russia. I'm helping them synchronize with what's happening around them. But the real issue here is if we are so ignorant and if we are so blind, to the world and to the environment that we are existing in, then we'll have surprises happen to us every day. For example, Prime Minister, just a couple of minutes ago, answered the question whether we are moving towards high taxes or more liberal conditions. He answered that question as if this choice exists. This choice no longer exists. Look at the demographic data that you cannot correct in the year two or five. It will tell you quite clearly we're moving towards high taxes. We will have no ability to decrease the expenditures because expenditures are fixed, like defense expenditures, infrastructure expenditures. And the number of taxpayers will decrease. The math is very simple here. You don't really have to have any type of degree to answer that question. So what does that mean? That means that either we move towards the models that enable us to pay high taxes. What does that mean? That means that we have administration that we as society trust. Because if we have administration that we as society do not trust, each and every one of us will evade taxes, will evade paying those taxes. What will that mean in turn? that we have to build a society, build on trust, build on transparency, the system that has checks and balances, the system where every voice, even minority of voices, heard. It means that this system will have to be built on liberty principles. Either we build a system today or we'll miss this window of opportunities. After our victory, I'm talking about military victory as the baseline here. Marislav Marinovich said it doesn't matter to look at the options of what happens to a state if the state is dead. After our victory in this war, we'll have this very short window of post-traumatic growth. It will take probably one or two political cycles. It, the analogy is like your children growing up. You will never have your child be five years old again. And if you miss things at that age, you will never be able to catch up. The same thing with us. If we move into this rapid post-traumatic growth stage that creates opportunities for economic growth, for GDP growth, for generations ahead, if we enter this stage with non-competent administration, we'll waste all of these opportunities. We'll just blow steam and that will be it. What's important right now? We are rapidly moving toward personalized leadership. So for, what does that mean? That means that there is a leader who is responsible. He takes this responsibility and he starts moving this ship. The issue with personalized leadership is that if the leader makes a mistake, there's nothing we can do. An alternative to that is building a system 
of institutions, building checks and balances. And the establishment of these systems is something we have to do for the next couple of years. And in order to do that, if we want business to be heard in this process, business has to be included in those uh, communal competence. Business has to learn how society functions, how the state functions. We have to move out of our comfort zone. If we do not do that, we are risking ending up in a situation where we are moving on a very slippery road at night with our lights off, and every turn becomes a surprise. Thank you, Yevhen. I really wanted to hear more, but we are super limited in time. Thank you so much for bringing us back to economic issues, because it's the Kiev International Economic Forum. And thank you for giving us this hint. I want you uh, to welcome Isabel Dumont, our speaker. I have introduced you, ma'am previously. So we are welcoming you to this conversation, but I'm going to give you a little time to get used to the discussion. Currently, we are evaluating Ukrainian position in the world after victory. And so I'll give the floor to Natalia first. Natalia, before you had started, I'm going to give a short intro because I've been told that moderator do not only gives the floor to people, but also says something. So I decided to say something that I sort of previously and then the prime minister actually hinted uh, towards something. And as our thesis on digitalization, we'll have my colleagues from the phone here. Unfortunately, they're not saying hi to me, but I'm going to actually question the thesis that digitalization is drastically improving the state. It's improving certain services, certain elements of services. Of course, we're feeling more comfortable with our phone in our hands and we are without it with different registers, with drawing information. We'll see people uh, having trouble with it abroad. But the fact that they have trouble with it doesn't mean there's less investment. There's no real correlation between digitalization and investment market. There's no real difference between digitalization, there's not a real correlation between digitalization and tax levels. So what we have to do is we have to create these tools, we have to create a culture where paying taxes is not just due diligence, but it's also beneficial for all. And also investments come with trust, of course, like Yevgen said. Natalia, yesterday we spoke about corporate culture, and I used a term that's widely used in business. I know that all of you probably know this expression, that any strategy is eaten by corporate culture for breakfast or for lunch, which means that if there is not a real corporate culture, developed corporate culture based on values, it can be a factor that destroys a lot of great strategies. Natalia, the floor is yours. You have five minutes. Thank you so much. I'm going to start with um, backing up. You've had here not only great intellectuals, consultants, strategic consultants feel like we have to uh, join the EU. We have numbers. The sociological study that was conducted in September 2022, if in December 2021, 48 respondents And uh, the, uh, it's, it's a very representative account. If 48% of individuals express their willingness for Ukraine to join NATO, in August 2022, that number grew to 79%. 79% of Ukrainians believe that we have to join NATO. And 98% of Ukrainian citizens believe that we have to join the EU. The EU wasn't sure, and we weren't sure for a while. The day before yesterday, uh, in the University of Shrenka, I spoke to Professor Hrutsak and he said, look, for the first time, the Ukrainians believe that Ukraine is moving in the right direction right now. Right now, we are moving in the right direction. So it, it took the full scale invasion. It took this conflict for us to understand that we are moving in the right direction. So starting from culture. L late at night yesterday, not having that electricity, I spoke to Volodymyr about culture. And I'm, I'm going to approach this topic uh, <laughs> for all the way back. I only have 48 slides, so I think I have enough time. No, culture is not a decorative element 
of our daily life. It's not something that happens after we have our fancy dinner. Culture is our way of living, is our way of existing, is our way of organizing our experience, making conclusions from this experience. Culture is a defining element of modernization. It defines the essence and the direction of modernization. I believe this is horrible value practices, those horrible value systems that become the norm for us are stopping the modernization. No matter how many great economic, I actually think I might be moving against the grain here. No matter how many great economic plans or strategies we build, it doesn't matter if we do not change our own value systems, our own opinions, no modernization will ever take place. Once again, it's a cultural trap. It's an actual term. If our values don't change, if, our, if the direction and the essence of modernization doesn't change, we fall into this trap. We have to work on it. I really love the term, which was developed by the National Institute of Strategic Studies, consensus abidance by law. Do you know what this is? I'm actually bragging here. So this consensus abidance by law is I would pay taxes, but nobody else pay taxes. So why would I ever do that? I would park my vehicle in the right place. But look, uh, 184 vehicles parked here. They're parked in the wrong way. So that's what I'm going to do. These behavioral practices are very destructive. They're ceremonial, they're traditional. The practices that we participate in every day are very destructive. This is something we have to deal with. I said that before. There are a little bit of key players here, your family, something that you, the values that you establish, the behavioral patterns, the leadership patterns that you establish within your family, because your children will repeat, will repeat these patterns. The second are, is the system of national education. Montserrat Dubernay is one of the most uh, influential scientists studying the national identity. She says that there isn't a single scenario, but there are a couple of scenarios that actually strengthen national identity. And she believes that the key player, not only the uh, joint enemy, joint enemy actually strengthens the nation, but also the key role is played by the national system of education. Have you read the history books of your children? It doesn't matter whether your children are in school or in university. Ukraine does not really have a single history book for the entire nation. And it's not about unity as normativity, but also about our vision of ourselves. I'm going to come back to the values. There's a great study that I recommend to all of you because all of our theses this is something that we teach students. We have to back up our thesis by actual numbers. So there is a World Value Survey in Hilharten, made by Ingrid and Wenzel. Ukraine has changed greatly. We missed the wave of 2013, but we have 2011 and 2020. I believe that the situation is becoming even stronger right now. So a few words about our values, about myself, about all of you here about Volodymyr here. A few words about us as a community. There are 20% more people who are proud of being Ukrainian. And so today, approximately 85, 86% of people are proud of being Ukrainian. And the absolute majority of them are ready to defend their country with weapons and their arms. That happened in 2020, so we have a proof of that right now. The number of people who tolerate people suffering from AIDS have increased. The number of people who believe that women in politics is something that is normal, something that is good, has also increased. But there are also numbers that destroy me personally, that shake me to the core. The numbers of people who are not tolerant of people of other race and other religion living next to them has also increased. So the number of these people, xenophobic people, has increased. Xenophobia is growing. And the number of people who believe that university education for women is less significant than educational than in university education for boys, the number of these people has also grown. Maybe that's a treatment of academia. No, no, we're not. We're talking about gender egalitarianism. This is very important, feminization and feminism as a tool that enables us to hear the voices of everybody, something very important. We're talking about the project of future Ukraine right now, of Ukrainian stance in the world. I recommend all of you to look at this study of this survey because we're looking at the mirror. Culture is this mirror. There's no way for us to build our future 
Right, I'm just going to give you the final statement right now, if I may. I'm going to quote my colleague, Volodymyr Yermolenko. Colleagues, uh, please remember, Volodymyr Yermolenko said that there are two forms of development right now. Agora and Agon. Agora is the ability to communicate, communicate ability to find partnership, and Agon is um, endless competition. After Agon that we will then in, I believe that we'll move towards Agora. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. I have a rapid fire question to you. Please, yes or no? Answer yes or no if you may. Yvonne, Valeria, Isabel, if you may answer, that would be great. We shocked ourselves and the world with our reaction to the war. I think shocked is the right word because everybody had their own expectations. I had my own expectations how Ukrainians will act. And every day we're observing people, cooperation, mutual trust, support. It's everywhere. Do the statistical data from the survey fit? Do you think we can shock people by this change, that we will become a qualitatively new environment? Do you think that we can shock people with this qualitative change, not waiting for another two generations of teaching people to be better, but do you think we'll be better? We definitely can be the people who realize their dreams, who make their dreams come true. And we forget one thing, we are an industrialized nation and it enables complicated solutions for us. It means that we are able to change really quickly. We can become sophisticated, can become complex. We are capable of that. It's not even a question. But if there will be no security, and look at what lack of security does to everybody. It removes a few points off of their EQ. If we'll have no partnerships that enable us to create solutions, security solutions or economic solutions, and all of the solutions that exist right now are collective solutions, you cannot exist separately and be successful. If we cannot achieve this, we'll fail. Already? I spoke about the critical mass of individuals who are willing to create change as a second factor after security. Prior to the beginning of this year, we had 15% of these people, 15% of people who want to change. If after the victory, we'll have 25% of those people on average, this means we'll be able to become different, we'll be able to surprise everyone. If not, as a result of trauma, as a result of migration, as a result of many factors, will be able to shock the world in a negative way. Have we wasted a great victory? Natalia? I would like to remind all of you that there is this notion of symbolic capital. Ukraine probably possesses the biggest, in the, the biggest symbolic capital in the world right now, and we have to invest the symbolic capital into our victory, into our future after our victory. Maybe the people who are coming back from the front lines, I'm not talking solely about the military front lines, maybe those people will be carrying this new worldview. And it's not about the tr credit of trust, but it's about the deposit of trust. If we use it, it will bring us dividends, it will bring us a great income, and we'll become a different nation. I'll uh, happily give the floor to Isabel Dumont. Oh, it's extremely important for us to know your vision of the future after the war. Mr. Hanna has just said that from his view, the membership for Ukraine and NATO and the, in the EU is already very much anticipated in the world. I talked to you by phone yesterday, and you think the same. So this shared view of our perspective in the EU. So this is the floor to you, and could you kindly comment on that, what you see the future of Ukraine to be after the war? Je suis très heureuse d'être avec vous aujourd'hui. This was a test for French, a test for the membership in the EU. 
For the membership in the EU, we are ready to hear you in whatever language, even in French. I apologize for being late. You should understand that I was in another hotel when there was a fire alert and I couldn't come here in time. I beg your pardon, I'll be speaking in English because as you can see, my Ukrainian is not very good. I thank my interpreters for that. Uh, first of all, um, before talking about uh, how Ukraine will be after the war, uh, we need to state that uh, the war has already changed. Uh, not not waiting after the war. Uh, there there are already very important changes. Uh, one that for us in France and in all European Union is is very important is that we have understood that. Uh, peace in Europe, in, on the European continent, is uh, no longer a given, but is seen now as a constant struggle for all of us together. Um, the war in Europe, where you were t talking about education and history and school, etc., Euro Europe uh, used to see war as history in history books. Uh, now war is present and, and is a, a real stake today, which is a very different moment. Uh, we also understand now that democracy is, now, is no longer considered as an unquestionable regime. It is challenged and we have to cherish it. Um, and generally, freedom is no longer a given, uh, and we have to fight for it, and you are fighting for it. Uh, so those are the main things that already have changed in our vision. Uh, you here is in Ukraine more than us, but including in, your, in uh, the Western Europe, we see those changes already happening. Uh, now, as first of all, I would like to... Um, before talking about uh, how uh, will the world change after Ukraine's victory, uh, if, you, if you allow me, I, I think we need to, to state that, first of all, Ukraine has to, has to win, right? Uh, because if we discuss about what will be after, we need to make sure then first that we make it happen. Uh, two things I want to say about that. Uh, so to make sure that Ukraine wins, uh, we need to continue to provide weapons. Uh, and I want to tell you, not only France, but with our partners, we are now, you know, that we have been working uh, to support Ukraine uh, efforts in defense, and we are working specifically on air defense. Uh, so, so now there, there is, you know, the, the maximum effort that will be given on air defense because this is, and we saw that again those past days, including this morning, this is the main task that, that we have to achieve uh, all together. Um, this is about, uh, if you want, war effort. The second one, which is also very important is the diplomatic efforts uh, that we need to continue as a diplomat. This is uh, what we are trying to do, what we are doing, meaning explain to the world uh, why Ukraine needs to be supported and why Russia war effort needs to be blocked. This is about international law, this is about international references, the UN Charter, Charter and all what was built during the, the second, uh, the 20th century, that all of us need to, to, to explain to the world. And Ukraine, I have to say, has been uh, um, extending also its efforts with us to, the, to third countries to explain why it is important, not only for the European continent, not only for Western countries, but for the whole world, because this is about international values and this is about the stability of the of the whole world we've seen that on the, on the grain issue on, on the food uh, issue uh, that when ukraine shakes it's the whole world that shakes so this diplomatic effort to explain to the world what why this war is not only an uh, european war but it is it is something that is shaking the whole world values is something that we will continue uh, to do and that that does matter
The second uh, thing that I wanted to, to say about first ensuring that, uh, that we, we make uh, Ukraine succeed is about resilience. Uh, as you were mentioning before, Ukraine has shown itself as not a lot uh, expected, even maybe in, within Ukraine, uh, that we, we, we all of us discovered uh, uh, Ukraine for those who did not know Ukraine so, so well. Uh, a Ukraine strong, a people strong, ready to to combat and to to to, to hold. Uh, but this has to be supported, uh, and I want to congratulate really the Ukrainian people. But we have to support you. We are doing that, as you know, with budgetary support, with finan financial support. I spoke already about military support. But now, and there have been, as you know, conferences on, uh, on the reconstruction of Ukraine, but that has been focusing or thinking more about the after, precisely after the war. But to be honest, uh, and we are in constant discussion with uh, the Ukrainian authorities about that, we also need now, uh, as winter is coming, to, to help to support Ukraine short-term uh, needs, uh, basically miss meaning a missile, uh, you know, hits uh, infrastructure. We have to make sure that uh, that energy supplies are, are sufficient, that it works, that water, I mean, all the, all the, uh, that school you were, we were discussing about, this is absolutely essential because we are thinking about the, U the future of Ukraine. We cannot have a sacrifice generation. So, you know, we have to make sure that uh, that uh, shelters exist in schools so that school can function, et cetera, all those issues that you know better than me. So why am I talking about that? Uh, to tell you it's already public and we are working on it. Uh, it's also one of the reasons why I'm, I'm here in Kiev today. Uh, we will organize a conference on the 13th of December in Paris. We are now starting to, to organize that precisely on those short term uh, for the winter basically needs, uh, meaning that we will try to have a, a, a sort of a, a net of focal points in all countries ready to support Ukraine. And by the way, we are not only talk talking about Western countries, but all countries in the world that would be ready to support Ukraine, to facilitate, to support those, all the needs, the immediate needs in the coming weeks and months. Um, to, we, we need to build a net of, uh, of support to make sure that we know exactly what are the needs, as precise as possible, and that we can coordinate as, as, as good as possible to, you know, to, to achieve what is, what is necessary. Um, the second thing, now that we have said that uh, we need to first help Ukraine succeed, is indeed uh, uh, how will, uh, I will, I'm coming back to the title, how will the world change after Ukraine's victory? Well, I would a bit change, if you allow me, the, the, this title to say uh, that we need to make sure that the world will have changed. It's not only how will the world passively, if you want, how the world will have changed, but how we need today to make sure that the world will have changed. I would say two things, main, a, a lot of things will have to be to changed, but to make main two things as I see it. First is the respect of international law. We need to make sure, as we know that the world will, will never be ideal, right? But we need to make sure that in the future, once we've seen this, that international law will be better respected. And this is why us as France, but it's not only France, but France has, has put the first effort probably uh, with, as you probably know, with the DNA specific uh, support, uh, with, uh, with specialist experts from the French gendarmerie, which who came to, to Ukraine several times, whole teams. Um, uh, we need to, to help the justice system combat uh, this, both in Ukraine and internationally, uh, to fight against impunity so that this never happens again. The second point is, um, and I think it is very important, to avoid falling into a new division of the world. The world after the war in Ukraine should not be a world that would be divided. And this is also this, pol this diplomatic struggle that we are, that we are working on. Uh, what Russia is trying to do is to divide the world, right? To present 
you know, to, to have countries with Russia, countries with, without, and trying to, to say that if you, are, if you are with Ukraine, you, you see what, what they are trying to do. This is precisely we are trying to do basically the contrary, uh, to avoid a division of the world. Uh, and we need to see, uh, to see big countries, uh, I'm not going to name them, understand that we should not fall into this trap uh, just be simply because this is not in their interest. It is not in their interest. The interest of, uh, the, interest of the big countries uh, and the third countries, again, I'm not talking about the European continent, is, uh, is and th they know it. This is why they are not falling so much. Very, very trap. true. Ms. Dima, I apologize. As organizers will, will make me uh, critics as I just somehow overlap in the, the next meeting on the next session. We'll start. One minute. If you have one minute, yes, please. One minute to, 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 to end is just to, as a conclusion, uh, I was getting to the conclusion in any case, is to say that is to say that uh, the, the, the Ukraine has already changed its image. I just wanted to say that. You mentioned statistics. Uh, it is all, I can tell you, I can testify as, as coming from France that the image of Ukraine has already changed and therefore the world has, has, has changed. Okay. And congratulations for that. Thank you very much. Just uh, let you. Time has elapsed, time has flown, and before we sum it up, I would, I'm so happy and I want to make sure that everybody is also happy, everyone is impressed and so grateful of our speakers for such saturated, deep and rich thoughts that we have been, um, we have known each other for a long time. And I would like the audience to thank you and all of the other speakers for the time that you have taken out and set aside for the thoughts that you have shared with us. Also to thank our organizers when we have the alarms and transportation is not running and this event is taking place so well organized. I would like to thank all of you who have given your thoughts and ideas and efforts in order to make sure that all of the communication has been working smoothly. But the summary of our conversation is, it's a great pleasure and it's not difficult. The whole world has to become better. The better world is not a given. It's something that we need to fight for, and I can quote you. And frozen conflict, something that Mr. Hanna referred to. If they persist, they don't make the world better. Frozen conflicts have to be settled something that Valeri, Natalia, and Yevgen have referred to concerning the solutions to these entanglements and how such countries as Ukraine stand the chances of um, overwhelming the world and creating effective uh, societies with effective freedoms and effective governance controls. There is this desire, there is a chance, but once again, it's not a given. And that's something that we need to fight for, and this is what we are doing. Thank you all, and we wish you a wonderful conference today. Thank you. Goodbye.